Welcome to this ISPI Roundtable on the Sahel. My name is Giovanni Carbone, I'm head of the Africa program uh, at ISPI and today we shall discuss um, the developments and politics of the crisis in the, in the Sahel as they are changing over time. Uh, we will discuss these issues with four panelists. They are Emanuela Del Rey, uh, EU Special Representative for the Sahel, uh, Jean-Hervé Gézéquel, uh, Director of the Sahel Project at the International Crisis Group based in Dakar, uh, Abdoulaye Mardieye, UN Special Coordinator for Development in the Sahel, and Joe Siegle, Director of Research at the Africa Center for Strategic Studies based in Washington. Thank you very much. Uh, welcome, thanks for joining us and for joining this discussion, for contributing to the debate tonight. We will have about 45-50 uh, minutes uh, to hear from you and then we'll uh, see if we can, we have, uh, we, we can have a few minutes uh, to answer to some of the questions that will come from the audience. From the audience. So I, I invite those who are following us to ask their questions via Zoom, uh, via the Zoom platform. Uh, let me just make some quick remarks uh, before I turn it to our panelists. The Sahel crisis uh, is now 10 years long. Uh, it's not just um, a long crisis, but it's arguably the single most complex crisis uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa since independence, um, except maybe with the one uh, in the Great Lakes region uh, that was ignited by the Rwandan genocide back in the 1990s. Uh, this complexity is made of uh, jihadism, is made of cross-border contagion, it's made of external armed interventions, it's made of uh, regime changes and of very strong geopolitical competition among major powers. Uh, and all this happens in a very fragile context that is also deeply affected by macro processes such as um, migration and climate change. Most of all, behind and beyond the kind of shopping list I've just made, uh, there's lots of people who are suffering immensely on the ground. But the complexity of the crisis um, is also uh, the result of the fact that uh, this crisis has never ceased to evolve and change. And this is exactly the reason why we want to um, address again the question of what's going on in the Sahel uh, with the discussion tonight. Um, I want to start with uh, Jean-Hervé uh, Gézéquel and, and ask you, Jean-Hervé, um, how is the decade-long crisis in the Sahel currently evolving? Uh, where, where do we stand at this point? Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Giovanni, for, for inviting me. Uh, and yeah, good afternoon to, to everyone. Well, the, the short answer to your question is that the, the situation is, um, is clearly deteriorating. Uh, what we have seen in the last couple of years is uh, uh, a new kind of uh, pattern. You know, the crisis in the rural countryside with jihad insurgencies has not connected with political troubles in the urban centers. And this is proving a, a, an explosive situation in the three countries uh, we are dealing with, uh, 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 you know, uh, the Sahel project, you know, at ICG. Um, we have new patterns of violence, which are extremely worrying as uh, all armed groups are, are engaged in abuses, sometimes massive abuses against civilians. Um, the prospect for a solution through dialogue has never been as weak as it is today. Um, and, uh, you know, you know, while, you know, Mali transition in Mali, Burkina and Niger, you know, claim that they want to, to break with past uh, policies and that they want to reposition the Sahelian state as fully sovereign state. They have actually maintained a line of continuity with the way uh, Western countries uh, have invested primar primarily uh, in military option. As a matter of fact, they have actually doubled down on these uh, uh, military focused strategy. Um, to be sure, you know, military transition should be uh, should be held accountable for the situation in the Sahel today. Uh, but what we what we witness is also the, the legacy, the result of uh, Western and international actors' failures in the region. And among the many failures, you know, I cannot describe all of them, but I want to stress our limited capacity to understand that governance issues were central to any sustainable solution. And that, you know, the Western focus on countering violent extremism and slowing down migration cannot work at all in a context where citizens are extremely disappointed with their, 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 their political system. You know, to conclude, you know, I would like to, to share, you know, what uh, 
a European diplomat told me back in 2014, 10 years ago. He told me, you know, look, Hervé, you know, we don't know how to fix this state, how to transform this state, but at least we know how to restore stability and security in the region. I was very, very impressed at that time, but I, I can say today that he was actually terribly wrong. We won't be able to address any security issues in the region unless Sahelians decide by themselves to transform their, their governance systems. Thank you, John Hervé. Let me turn to uh, Joe, Joe Sigler um, of the uh, Africa Center for Strategic Studies, as I mentioned. Um, Joe, um, John Hervé mentioned already uh, the external involvement in the Sahel, which has been uh, very important from the very beginning. How has that been um, evolving recently? Uh, does the idea France out, Wagner, Russia in sums uh, much or most of what is going on? And in particular, what are the implications of uh, the withdrawal of French troops on the ground? Well, thank you, Giovanni. It's a pleasure to be on the panel today. Well, the role of external actors in the Sahel is very central. And in fact, they're integrally linked to the coups that we have seen in Mali, Burkina Faso, uh, and and Niger now, but also, also Guinea and, and the others. And you know, with these coups, we're seeing a flipping of uh, international partnerships. Um, and indeed, uh, without the coups, you know, Russia would have very minimal uh, influence in the Sahel. Uh, even now, you know, Russia is not investing very much in any of these countries, economically, uh, politically. Uh, even in terms of security, there's a misnomer that you know, deployment of Wagner is somehow a security force. You know, they're only putting in a thousand or you know, fifteen hundred troops in in Mali. This is not intended to help uh, stabilize Mali or protect the population. This is about protecting the regime in Mali, which is in thereby uh, enabling Russian influence. You know, and this has been accompanied by uh, massive disinformation campaigns. Of course, all the juntas are benefiting from this, and they're very receptive to that external influence. So it is flipping the arrangements. I think we have to be careful, though, and not generalizing to say that the entire region has shifted their attention. I think uh, we have to recognize that you know a democratic framework for engaging the population, for allowing popular expression, has been lost, and with that. Um, it's hard then to engage and, and uh, identify how these countries want to uh, involve the West. Let's let's keep in mind, you know, ninety percent of foreign direct investment, over ninety percent of development assistance, ninety percent trade, is is coming from from the West. And so these, you know, very real factors are, are still very central to this relationship. Thank you, Joe. Uh, Mr. Abdullaye Mardieye, UN Special Coordinator for Development in the Sahel. Um, let me ask you about the UN involvement specifically and the withdrawal of the UN mission from Mali. What are the implications uh, of that? What are the risks connected to that? Uh, is there any upside to it? Uh, thank you. Uh, thank you, MC. Thank you, Giovanni, but I have to preamble my response to your question by saying that uh, to requalify uh, the title of our discussion, when we say uh, what is what is what has changed uh, in the Sahel, um, my reading would be uh, what are, are we not reading well? Uh, the messages that all these complexities, these these coups, and the crisis are telling us. Um, well, simply put, but before I say that, I, and I agree with uh, your preamble is. Um, um, the combination of fragility uh, with the kind of tectonic shift on the geopolitics is creating in the Sahel a really uh, a radioactive moment. So any match can sparkle a terrible drama. Any match, be it a coup uh, that even people don't like, but they abide to it by, by despair of the, order, of the old order, or any street you know, movement, any, any political uh, rift or social unrest, can trigger a destabilization. So that's fundamentally what is happening in the Sahel, and principally because 
collectively, collectively, but mainly the role of government, uh, we haven't delivered the social contract. So even this constitution that we are saying, uh, going back to the constitutional order is a fallacy because the, const the constitutional order is not reflecting the social contract. Unless, unless we deliver on the social contract, uh, the need of the people, building people agency, we will fail in the Sahel, number one. Number two, uh, there's an illusion of optics uh, to see the Sahel as an aggregation of, of, of countries. The Sahel is a region. Uh, you, you, you know, it's, I would even always say that uh, these, these, these countries are almost virtual in, in, in their existence. And we are, what we are missing in the Sahel it is collective political leadership uh, in the Sahel. We, 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 we put it in, in terms of governance, but it's you don't have a collective championship in the Sahel that we had when we had Idris Deby. Uh, we had it in Bazoum, uh, we are losing Bazoum, but collectively we missed it. Now, going back to your question of Mali, um, um, it's horrible. I'm, 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 we're already feeling a black hole in the in the Lipta Kuguma, starting with Mali, Burkina Faso, now Niger. Um, um, uh, the, the, you know, Mali is feeling now a big hit uh, after just one one week, one month, one year of crisis. They have lost one percent of, of 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 GDP growth, which is quite quite big, um, and it is having an influence to the entire region. No, if you combine um, the crisis in Mali, Burkina Faso, and Niger, if you add to it the destabilization uh, 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 actions on, on, on sanctions and on, on suspension of aid uh, that might have an intended consequences, if you aggregate all that, uh, you are seeing a terrible vortex of, of, of fragility and despair in the Sahel that is not only hitting the free Lipta Kogurma, the entire region is feeling it already. Let me give you just one metric. Um, you know, in the in the in the in the West African Monetary Union uh, countries, the the UMWA, they used to have inflation that stabilized around around three percent. Now they are six point two percent. So they're all feeling the the point. Now coming back to Minusma, uh, it's a disaster to to to, to have this retreat. You see, Minusma wait uh, one point two billion dollars a year. Uh, just the Keynesian effect of taking out Minusma is horrible. Now. Fortunately, the UN country team is not leaving. Uh, we invest $400 million per year there. We're not getting back the $1.2 billion that, that, that MINUSMA will be, will be leaving there. But at least um, uh, our resident coordinator have a good engagement with the government. This uh, minister, uh, for instance, Abdullah Job, whom I see just a minute ago. And they are willing really to work with um, uh, the UN country team to minimize the, the withdrawal of the, of the, of the MINUSMA. Of course, big budget of the MINUSMA was not on development, but mostly on security. And that is my, 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 my worry. And I even worry that if we are not collectively engaging, keeping engaging uh, in the entire uh, 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 Lipta Kogutma, I worry that uh, we might have a Sahelistan uh, in, the, in the Sahel. And, 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 and really, uh, this can be a disaster. So my message to all of us is stay engaged, stay engaged at a higher scale. Uh, let me put, put a footnote before I, I go back to you. Uh, we collectively we are our part of responsibility. Governments did not deliver well, but international support was scattered. I even call it a tapis d'Arlequin. It's a Arlequin tapestry. And let's be frank, uh, uh, ODA lately has been just an extension of uh, 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 bilateral countries' foreign policies. They were not tilted to toward investing on aggregated transformation of the Sahel. So we collectively have our part of responsibility. Unless we agree on the kind of Sahel consensus or Sahel common ground for that all of us convey, convey, converge into tra structural transformation of the Sahel, well, we are, not, we are not reading well the message that we are getting from the Sahel. To wrap you here, I want to come back to the question of, of uh, to development issues, but um, I want also first to go back to the question of external interventions, external influences, and, and hear from Emanuela de Re, EU Special Representative for the Sahel. Um, can I ask you this? Across the Sahel, there seems to be a demand for getting rid of external influences, not just France, maybe, or at least for profoundly changing uh, existing relationships. Is it, is it there, this demand? And is it just a demand from the new military juntas, or is there a strong uh, popular demand as well for, 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 for really uh, 
um, cleaning uh, from the presence of uh, particularly uh, French and other Western actors? And how should Europeans react to this if this is the case? Thank you very much for this question. I would like to say that it depends on how we interpret this, this issue in the sense that for the European Union that I represent, meaning I represent 27 member states, uh, the concept of ownership uh, that means that a country is uh, the, the, the owner of its own destiny, it's absolutely a must. We uh, have the ambition to help uh, the African countries to achieve this important goal of uh, ownership of their own destiny. So if we interpret the idea of wanting to be free from uh, uh, external aid, yes, one day I really hope and everybody hopes there will be this opportunity to see ownership become a reality. At the same time, of course, there is another interpretation, which is the negative interpretation, which is highly ideological and is affecting the situation very strongly at the moment, so much that, as you know, the idea of ownership has been transformed in as an overemphasized concept of sovereignty and people in the countries of the Sahel would like to, uh, let's say, somehow uh, distance themselves from uh, external uh, partners or actors and uh, at the illusion of being completely free. But if we look at the situation in the countries of the Sahel that Mart Dieh rightly described as a region with distinct countries, with distinct situations, we see that unfortunately the conditions are very complex. And in order to overcome the various crises from humanitarian to uh, security to um, others, um, of course, uh, we, the, our help is absolutely needed. And this is why the European Union is providing help and support on the basis of a, of a, of a partnership that we have built during the decades. And nowadays is a very solid partnership so much that we are the main partner of each country of the Sahel. Of course, it's difficult to talk about this, but in, if we look at numbers, uh, the proportion of intervention of the European Union, for instance, is absolutely huge. And uh, uh, every chapter, uh, from security to development to humanitarian, we are really the main partner, which means that if we leave, if we abandon the region, the impact of our uh, sense would be immense. And this is something that we are defending very strongly because we are on the side of the population. And we know that while there might be an ideological discourse, at the same time, there is a need for concrete answers. And this is what we want to give concrete answers that really uh, help the countries on the basis of the partnership we have established. Dr. To... Duray, I do understand, let me interrupt you, uh, I do understand that we are on this, and I would agree that we are on the side of the populations, but are the populations on our side or are well, they I mean... on another side? Are they no longer supporting this kind of external, uh, this, this kind of external presence? Well, it depends on the levels of uh, interpretation of this uh, concept, because if we look at it from the point of view of the ideological distortion of this relationship operated by some uh, politicians in the region, certainly you see that, of course, uh, uh, the narrative has an impact on the public opinion, and part of the public opinion might react, uh, enhancing the anti-Western, especially anti-Western sentiment. Nevertheless, I have to tell you that at local level, people see the kind of work that is done and they have a different opinion. And at the same time, I want to tell you there are so many projects still ongoing. There are so many uh, interesting initiatives and important humanitarian aid ongoing that in the end, while there is one level of narrative, on the other hand, there is an, a level of narrative with us which is completely different based on concrete uh, examples of interventions that are really having an impact. Mardieye himself 
made a statement regarding MINUSMA, what we think that MINUSMA is going to be destroyed. It is very complex. It's not such a thing as black or white. We have to see the nuances. Just to give you an example, we have suspended as European Union many of our initiatives in Mali because we had a crisis, political crisis with Mali. Nevertheless, we still have millions of development pro pro cooperation projects ongoing. Besides the fact that we have one mission, EOCAP Mali, which is a, a capacity building for the police, uh, still fully operational in the country. So as you can see, we can't, we can't really define things according to very simplistic uh, uh, concepts. It's much more complex in, realta, in reality and uh, much more articulated so much that uh, there is still very much space to operate and to reconstruct, reconstruct thank you, thank you. partnerships for the future. Um, Joe, I want to hear your opinion on this, on, on the issue of how deep is anti-French sentiment and whether this is an anti-West sentiment that we see in this region, uh, how, how widespread it is, and whether you have a sense that uh, this is something that is shared also in other parts of Sub-Saharan Africa. I'm thinking, for example, of uh, events in Ethiopia some time back, events in, in, uh, in South Africa. Is there some kind of a growing, broader aversion towards the West? Yeah, I don't think so. Um, I think we are in a very turbulent time and we have to be mindful that um, a lot of these narratives are being weaponized through disinformation. And there's been a very concerted campaign to blame all of the problems in the Sahel on the West, on colonialism, on, you know, on the United Nations, on democracy. Um, and again, this is being used for geopolitical purposes. As has been pointed out, um, you know, the West is the main uh, investor in West Africa, in Africa, and those investments are appreciated. Um, I think you know, the real question here is how can those investments, how can the partnership uh, between these external democratic actors and Africa be strengthened so that it is mutually beneficial? So that there is a sense, a growing sense of ownership, and that there is a, a shared uh, understanding of how this is uh, going to uh, enhance Africa's agency, Africa's prosperity, Africa's security. And so there's work to be done on how that is uh, enhanced. But I think there is, uh, you know, when, when we're when we're having a, a rational conversation. There's a lot there to be built on. And I think to put this in perspective again, because so much attention has been on what Russia has been doing and how somehow Russia is gaining influence in, in the Sahel, let's keep in mind that you know when Russia just had its uh, Africa-Russia Africa summit in St. Petersburg, only 17 African heads of state out of 54 attended. This is uh, in comparison to 43 African heads of states who attended the 2019 uh, Russia-Africa summit. And so a lot of African leaders realize that you know, Russia is not investing the continent. Uh, Russia is not bringing a lot of things that the continent needs other than instability. So there is an openness uh, and a desire to, to build on relationships with the West um, throughout, the, throughout the continent. We don't want to uh, over... Uh, interpret some of the rhetoric we're, we're seeing from the juntas uh, who are beholden to Russia in, in the Sahel. Thank you. Uh, Jean Hervé, uh, let me come back to you. Um, has competition among global powers now become the main reason for Western countries to be or try and, and remain uh, in the Sahel? Uh, what about the fight against uh, jihadism? Uh, which is not that often um, in the media as it used to be, maybe in, in, in Western media, for example, uh, in particular. In particular, 
And what about uh, migration management as a reason for European countries, notably, uh, being there? Uh, well, competition among global powers is, is clearly one of the main concerns in the region, um, but it's not uh, entirely new. Um, there are new important players today, um, like Russia, that was an important player in the 60s, were much less so in the 90s, and is making a, an impressive comeback, not for the better, unfortunately. Um, how long uh, is, is Russia going to be able to stay that influent? It's unclear, but you know, I don't see that necessar necessarily as something that is sustainable. As said, you know, previously Russia has, has some military capacity, but not much capacity to invest financially uh, in, in the region. But again, this is this is nothing new. I, I also remember how competition between uh, different regional powers interfered with the negotiation of the peace agreement uh, in Algiers back in in 2015. And beyond the competition between, you know, the, the West and Russia or the West and or, or Russia and France, you know, I, I can see how, you know, something that is less apparent is also you know, the, the tension developing between Western states themselves. Um, the situation in Niger is, is you know, would be illuminating if it was not tragic, you know. For instance, France seems to be alone, you know, in its position to push for a, a pretty tough position against the junta, including by considering a, a, a support to an ECOWAS led you know, military option. Uh, meanwhile, most European countries uh, you know, do not want to follow this path. You know, um, they, and some also want to negotiate with the junta you know, in order to preserve their, their assets in, in the country. You know, we are between we are between friends here, and I think we can speak, uh, you know, frankly. So I like to be a little bit provocative. You know, over the past decade, the Sahel has been something like a, an experimental lab for European countries and other partners. A lab where we could test new security policies uh, to train our, our special forces as well. The situation has changed, and the Sahel is no longer a field of experimentation for Western actors. In fact. The Sahel now seems to be a region that is testing the very fabric of European cohesion or European solidarity. Thank you. Um, Emanuela del Rey, do you want to react to this maybe before we move on? An uh, experiment, I don't know, because, uh, for instance, the latest uh, uh, European Union strategy for the Sahel was actually developed uh, in cooperation with the countries of uh, the Sahel, which means that, of course, uh, you know, the, the, the issues that were more pregnant uh, uh, and, uh, of course, more important uh, were identified on the basis of the real needs expressed by the countries themselves, uh, in uh, again, uh, in trying to uh, promote the principle of ownership and and certainly basing our uh, choices, um, common choices, on uh, the need, uh, for instance, to work on governance. On that, I have to say we have not really achieved much, as uh, the coup d'etat demonstrates. But in terms of, uh, you know, advancement of, of the societies and, uh, of course, uh, providing uh, help, we have done a lot in cooperation with the countries. Because, uh, just to give you a practical example, no project can be implemented without the agreement of the government at the local level, at the national level. So obviously there is a very strong cooperation. Of course, one thing that is lacking at the moment is also from the, the part of the, 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 of the European Union in particular and in the West in general. And this is why we are going through a very thorough introspection, I can tell you directly because I can be the witness of that. Uh, is the fact that we don't find the right way of communicating. It's very difficult to exchange nowadays. We have always been friends with uh, these our African countries, and at the moment it's very difficult to communicate directly, to find a common language, to understand each other on even basic things. And this means that we have to move a step forward, obviously, and we have to work on ourselves to uh, show uh, also the countries of the Sahel that uh, the, the, the European Union of today is not the European Union of uh, 40 years ago. We are completely different. Uh, if you consider that in the Sahel, we have the engagement of every single country of the European Union, from Lithuania to Poland to the Czech Republic to Spain, Portugal, Italy. It's, it's a 
it's a joy for me to see how much everybody is willing to contribute and to work together. So uh, this is something that we have to take into consideration because uh, this is the only way by which if we find the, the right language, we can readjust uh, the situation and make profit of uh, our actual investments and increasing our investment in terms of projects and cooperation to make sure that uh, our partnership is, is real and continues to be on an equal basis for ownership. Thank you. Um, Abdullah, I want to go back to the uh, questions of development progress, or rather develop the, the big development setback uh, for the region that you mentioned before. Um, what has been the impact of the energy and food crisis um, on development, on political stability, on social dynamics, but also uh, do you see any socioeconomic progress possible under the existing circum uh, circumstances, under the existing security conditions? Um, do these countries also offer opportunities? I would like to hear from uh, Emanuela de Rea also on this point. Uh, Abdullah, please. Yeah, thank you, uh, uh, Chair. Um, I just want to backtrack a little bit, bit as a preamble to my answer to say that uh, we academics, intellectuals, political leaders, or even juntas, uh, we're not understanding what's going on in the region. Uh, the region is an elite capture region. I see the junta as part of the elite. And the message we are getting from the people is that we are exercising our people's agency. Even you know, we, we, we betray ourselves in our language by saying this is an experimentation, a laboratory, uh, or, 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 you know, um, or investment for governments. Um, and the junta is making a big mistake if they think that they can play for populism and then win people. People are exercising the agency, especially young people in the country. Okay. Unless we understand that, whatever we do, it will be a sunk cost and a, to, to, um, um, to no avail. Now, we miss development, as I said, it, earlier, all of us missed it because we haven't done transformational development. Take the case of Niger, the extractive uranium. You know, there is no value, internal value retention for years uh, in, the, in the exploitation of uranium. I'm taking uranium, but all extractives. By the way, in the Sahel or in other parts of Africa, if you, if, if, you, if you put together the map of poverty and the map of extractives is the same. So simply, we haven't delivered transformative development in the, in, the, in, the, in the region, number two, and we are not heeding the voice of the people. We see still people as beneficiaries. No, this is, we are infantilizing people. They are agents, unless we understand that, and then liberate the people from the grip of the elite capture. Whatever we do will be a sunk cost, as economists will, will, will put it. The potentials are there, but the way we do development is wrong. Uh, the way we do it on, on the qualitative way, but on the, on the structural way. Investment aggregated in the continent, in the, in the side is what? Below 18% of GDP. And all empirical studies from IMS, World Bank, UNCTAD are telling that unless you reach a, a minimum floor of 20, 24%, you cannot trigger development. So we have the, the solution, but the, the goodwill is missing, in my, in my view. And the people are reminding us that, you know, if we could be obsolete actors if we don't hear the voice of the people. Can I say something? Dr. Dore, yes, I, I would like to hear you on, on the question of, of how big is the development no. setback and whether there are prospects for, for change and, and, and uh, under the current conditions. Yes, no, I, I wanted to, um, to add to what uh, Margie just said uh, regarding development cooperation and say that one of the major uh, problems, for instance, at the moment, and the reason why everything is connected, usually we use, a, we use this term, you know, the nexus between security, development, and uh, humanitarian is absolutely uh, true for the Sahel, because in the Sahel, uh, most of the time, we are so busy trying to solve the humanitarian emergencies that it's difficult to uh, concentrate on development and cooperation. I take the case of Burkina Faso. Burkina Faso, which is a country very dear to me, now they have uh, really more than 2 million IDPs, internal displaced persons, because of uh, terrorism in particular, 
and of course other things like climate uh, related climate change related events and so on uh, which means that of course when we talk uh, about how to uh, support the country the first thing we have to in, engage in is certainly uh, how to solve the emergency at humanitarian level which unfortunately deprives the country from the opportunity to invest more in development because even the authorities themselves they say first uh, tackle the problem of humanitarian uh, emergency and then of course we can invest more in humanitarian in uh, development when if you think about Burkina Faso uh, European NGOs have been working there for decades I think 50 or 60 years already so you can imagine how much this machine this uh, and engine has been going on. Of course, when Mardier talks about the agency of the people, I myself work very much for the youth in particular and with the youth because they are uh, in need of opportunities, uh, social spaces. I always say this uh, very typical slogan by which I say, if you think that because the youth in the Sahel possesses a, a, a mobile phone, they participate in the global debate, this is not so because they don't have any possibility to express themselves. In the last month uh, during the crisis uh, caused by the Punta uh, in uh, um, in Niger, I was in contact uh, with the, the youth all the time. Several representatives of the youth, activists, uh, students, researchers, and I can tell you what they lament is the fact that they have no space for expressing their own will, oppor opportunities uh, for expressing their opinions and be uh, part of this debate around Niger, which sees everybody talking except the people of Niger, because it's very difficult. And of course, we are all uh, very much impressed, negatively impressed by the fact that the junta is gathering 25,000 people, if not more, in a stadium who are, uh, of course, uh, showing the Russian flags and uh, uh, um, uh, um, talking about the importance of the junta and the work that is doing, but we don't know what the huge uh, part of the population is thinking and doing. This is a big problem we have. This is why I very much agree with Mar. We have to give social spaces to these people mm -hmm. with party building, because this is true for Niger, but all, all over the Sahel, to make sure that we have, uh, in, uh, we have the opportunity to give the people of the region the opportunity to build their own uh, future according to their own thinking and in a way by which that we can really have an interlocution that could be fruitful. Because for the moment, they are completely uh, uh, incapable of expressing themselves and we don't listen to them. Thank you. Let, let me move on uh, and um, go back to Jean Hervé. Uh, um, we, have made, we, have, we have so far focused on, on, the, on the Sahel itself, the area on the central western Sahel, as is the, the heart of the crisis. Uh, but there are countries uh, that have been also the object of a lot of attention over the past two or three years, the coastal states of West Africa, towards which there is a strong concern that uh, jihadist movements are, are trying, to, trying to expand their activities. There have been uh, some, some um, occasional uh, events. How big is this risk of an expansion of activity towards uh, these other states? Which countries are most exposed? And, and possibly also, what should be the responses? Well, uh, um, thank you for the question. And there, there are several risks when, when, when dealing with this contagion uh, issue. The first risk is that the, the GRD contagion uh, it is real. Um, uh, but we also need to understand that these groups still, uh, you know, these jihadist group, they still remain primarily focused on the Sahel. Um, they have some interest in the coast, but these interests can still best be understood as a, as a way to reinforce their position back home, in a way, back in their historic basis in the Sahel. For instance, nowhere, to my knowledge, do we see jihadist groups uh, in the coast that, that are independent, not even uh, autonomous, uh, from their leaders in the Sahel? This, this could happen, this could develop, but we are not there yet. Um, so still, you no. Know, this this it, it is a serious con concern for coastal countries. And and to answer your question, you know they don't react the same way. 
Uh, we at ICG, we, we have recently published a, a, um, a report on, on the northern part of Ivory Coast, and we have described how, you know, the, the, the government has, you know, tackled the issue uh, very, very early on, you know, and, and, and you know, deploying a, a multidimensional kind of, uh, of, uh, of policy that is, you know, uh, uh, you know, I think developing the right balance between security uh, uh, issues, but also, you know, uh, investment in, uh, in, in development. Um, but I think that there is also a second risk, uh, you know, when dealing with contagion, another form of contagion. And it is, you know, that foreign partners duplicate in the coastal countries what they have been doing in the Sahel, you know, in the, in the last 10 years. Uh, not only with the same limited uh, results, if not failures, but also introducing the same kind of um, troubles and, and frustrations, especially among the, the, the urban youth. Um, a frustration that played a role in, in triggering you know, the serious political crisis that we are witnessing. Therefore, you know, I, I really hope that you know, the lessons learned exercise that we've been doing in the last few years will serve to avoid making the same kind of mistakes uh, in, in the coast and avoid this second kind of contagion uh, in, in the region. Thank you, Jean Hervé. Let me use your last word, contagion, to move back to uh, Joe. Joe, there's another form of contagion that has been affecting the region, and that's uh, the, 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 very, uh, the increasing number of military coups that have been taking place, uh, primarily, of course, uh, in the Sahel itself, uh, but also beyond the Sahel. We have observed this in, 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 uh, in uh, Sudan, in Chad, in Guinea, in, in Gabon over uh, recent times, uh, recent years, and recent months. Uh, what do the three new regimes have in common, uh, or rather the three coups uh, that established new regimes in the Sahelian countries have in common among themselves? And do they share anything with the other countries where military coup also, also took place? I mean, this is a very, um, uh, very concerning dynamic that is taking place. Of course, it's a return of military coup. But now with the, with the most recent ones, uh, one really wonders who's next. Uh, I mean, can, should we start thinking that big countries in Africa might also be uh, at risk? Um, you know, think, think Nigeria, think Ethiopia, maybe not tomorrow, but the day after tomorrow. Joe. Yeah, it's a great question, Giovanni. Um, I would start by saying, there are some similarities between the coups. Um, you know, clearly in Niger, um, Burkina Faso, Mali, we saw militaries seizing power from democratic elected governments. Um, and so it's overthrowing and reversing the democratic trajectory that was trying to gain traction in those countries. Chad and Sudan, I would put it a different category. You know, here you already had military governments that had been in power for decades. And basically the coups were a, a continuity coup. They were uh, ensuring that the military would continue to be the dominant force. In Gabon and Guinea, um, I see these as opportunistic coups where the military seized power from unpopular uh, civilian leaders um, and claimed the mantle of reformers, but, uh, and, and, and in fact, in both cases, there were real grievances about what was you know, going on under the civilian governments, but we shouldn't conflate those grievances with what the juntas have done. They, they, these were coups about seizing power. Um, they have made no effort to restore democracy even though in both cases, in Guinea, you had uh, a democratic trajectory beginning to take hold over the last 10 years. And in Gabon, you just had an election and they could have counted the votes and uh, identified who the genuine winner was. So we shouldn't confuse grievances with the coups. These are coups about power. And it's an effort by these military juntas to restore the primacy of military governments. I think it's nothing less than that. You know, Africa, th 34 of Africa's countries have had a history of military government. And this is militaries reasserting their entitlement, their sense of entitlement that they should be 
the leading entity in governing these countries. And so because of the contagion, because of the momentum, I do think other countries are at risk of military coups. And, you know, the prime countries are those who have military governments where that vision of what the military can be in a society is is still alive. And so, you know, I think countries like Cameroon or Nigeria, um, DRC, are, are vulnerable. And certainly with the disinformation um, that's out there, you know, you know, Cameroon, I'm sorry, Cote d'Ivoire is under uh, um, a lot of pressure. Benin also has a history of military government. So I, I, I think there's no no shortage of countries that could be vulnerable. And I think that's really the, the seriousness of the moment that we're in. Thank you. Um, I want to spend uh, our um, last 10 minutes by trying to answer to, by posing you the answer that we are receiving from the audience. Um, and it further overlaps with something that I had in my mind, and um, it has to do with ECOWAS. The question is uh, this, uh, how should ECOWAS cope with the recently formed alliance of Sahel states, and what is the role ECOWAS should play in supporting an endogenous solution to the crisis? Who wants to uh, try and tackle this one? The role of ECOWAS. Well, I'm, I'm happy to jump in if nobody else will. Um, Thanks. First, I, 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 think, uh, yeah, I think to begin with, uh, it, it's revealing that this alliance of uh, military juntas is formed. It just shows you the degree of audacity on the part of these juntas that claim that they needed to seize power to restore security, when in fact now they're forming these alliances uh, to reinforce one another. So this is about political power. You know, the, the, the security crisis, the economic crises we're seeing in the Sahel um, are regional. They can't be contained now by any one country. And so you're going to need to have regional action. ECOWAS has to be at the center of this um, and trying to forge partnerships, trying to forge collaboration you know, it's through ECOWAS's leadership then that partnerships with international actors, which are also going to be needed in terms of resources and technology um, and, and other technical support um, are going to be so critical. And so I think, uh, you know, from an operational standpoint, this alliance of juntas is of limited uh, power. You know, they are all struggling to maintain security in their own countries. But politically, um, I think it is important for ECOWAS to reassert leadership and, and try to forge uh, collaborative actions, not just in West Africa, but with the African Union and really mobilizing some sustainable solutions in, in the region. Jean Hervé, uh, do you want to add uh, anything on this? How likely is it uh, that ECOWAS can actually play a role? So I, I think that, you know, uh, you know, ECOWAS is in crisis of, of credibility right now. Um, clearly, you know, they, they are, you know, uh, disconnected from, from you know, the, the population of the countries that they, they are supposed to, uh, so to represent today. Um, they are mostly seen as a, as a club of, of uh, you know, the president and, 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 you know, just raising the concern of the, the president. So I think that there is a need to reconnect. You know, I'm, I'm struck by the fact that uh, in Niger, you know, ECOWAS, you know, maybe, you know, pushing in, a, in, a, in, a, in the right direction, especially when it's trying to use dialogue in order to, uh, you know, to, to bring back, you know, the Niger toward, you know, a more peaceful and more useful kind of transition. But it's lacking connection with, uh, with the people uh, in Niger. And, you know, the ECOWAS can push as much as it wants, you know, uh, on, on the current junta. It won't be efficient if at the, min at the same time there is not... You know, from from Niger itself, from the civil society in Niger, you know, a similar push in the, in the same direction. And just to to, to you know, just, just to make a comparison with Mali, you know, many of us we believe that you know Mali is going in a, in a very bad direction. But back in 2020, uh, when there was when there was the first coup, ECOWAS was able to negotiate, you know, an, an agreement with the, with uh, with the CNSP with the UNTA. 
that was an interesting kind of agreement. And it was able to do so because there was internally, in Mali, forces pushing from the inside in the same direction toward a transition that could be acceptable because, you know, partially led by, by the civilians. And so I think that the way out for, for ECOWAS is to reconnect uh, with, uh, with, with the people of the region it represents. Abdullah Yamardieh, do you want to intervene on this, on the role of ECOWAS? Yeah, I like, I, 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 I... I'll go the same line. Uh, in fact, um, I might be politically incorrect to say that uh, ECOWAS needs to be reinvented or, or maybe go back to its original fundamentals. Um, in our discussion, we noted two things, the lack of space uh, to mitigate tensions and conflict nationally, and it's missing in most of these countries. There, there are not enough national space to mitigate tensions, and we don't have that much needed regional space to mitigate the tensions. The drama of ECOWAS is that they are acting like the Security Council of the region. ECOWAS was created to create, to open a space uh, for all segments of society, not only governments. Huh? Again, coming going back to my to my elite capture of governance. Here we have a government um, elite capture of ECOWAS, uh, uh, head of state's capture of ECOWAS. Now I think we have to be honest to ourselves. And then the the the, the, the stress we are getting in the lip of Burma country is a is a challenge to ECOWAS. Is a challenge to West Africa to reinvent that space. Um, la Sahelian, you know. Um, um, uh, it's a drama. In, in the Sahel, you don't hit your neighbor. You don't sanction your neighbor. Your cardboard cars boil when your house is burning. Uh, the neighbors has to come and fix it. And we haven't done it for Mali. All this drama because because ECOWAS failed to rescue Mali. Now this is the price we are paying. I, I think this is truly a reinvention moment of ECOWAS to be the ECOWAS of the states, of the people, of the private sector, of the young generation, of the women. That's what ECOWAS is for. We have to get out of this primitive, uh, by the way, it is true, not only ECOWAS, the Security Council, the EU, and everybody, we're in this primitive mode. We, have, we are in a, the, the, the world is going toward a solidarity mode. I blame all these sanctions. I even blame what, 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 what bilaterals are doing uh, by suspension of aid. These are tremendous humanitarian and human consequences, for God's sake. The world is, in, is suffering. We have to, we have to, our currency is hope and get our act together. When you react and sanction whenever there's a disturbance, well, this is disaster. I'm sorry to be politically incorrect, but it's my heart of the silence that is speaking. There is another question. Uh, let me re remain with you. There is another question from the audience. Uh, somebody demands, what can and should the UN do? Sorry, what should the, the United Nations do? Back to my to the to your map. Um, um, still, still to be politically correct. Um, I, I am not in the UN for uh, someone who is challenging the, the principle of solidarity. Uh, we say that okay, the UN should align to the AU, should align to the ECOWAS. I say no. I say no when. When the AU or the AU or NATO or any any group that deviate uh, from 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 the principle of solidarity, uh, which is the principle of the Charter, the UN has to step in. Remember, uh, Chapter One of the Charter said we the people, and sadly we ended the the Charter with Chapter Nineteen, signed by the government. And I always telling uh, Antonio Guterres that uh, his fight should be to write Chapter Twenty of the Charter back to the people. So the UN has to be a, a kind of a moment of the last resort uh, to, to speak up uh, wherever they see deviances being from countries, from, from regions, from subregions, from ECOWAS or NATO or the BRICS or whatever. Uh, the UN is, to, is our common ground where we, we speak truth to ourselves and truth to the people. So the UN, the UN is to be reinvented in my view. And by the way, this is the discussion we are having now at the, at the, at the at the, at the General Assembly. Uh, I like the, the, the statement by President Lula, who is going that line. Look, let's reset. Let's, let's create these common grounds and invest in that common grounds. That's what the UN is for. Uh, Dr. Dore, I'm, I'm reading from the questions again that come from the audience. Um, one says, 
Um, in the last year, Italy, but we might say Europe, if you prefer, has seen a surge in migration and notably a surge of arrivals of Malians and Burkina Bays. Um, is there a connection with the political changes in these countries? Is containing migration no longer a priority for the juntas? I have to tell you that it is, uh, the issue of migration is always on the table because um, in reality, uh, the, 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 the most consistent uh, movements of people are South-South. They interest uh, the, 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 the countries of the Sahel rather than uh, South-North, uh, meaning groups of people who go towards uh, Europe. Although, of course, uh, if you can imagine that the, 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 the flows are consistent towards Europe, Europe, you can imagine how much uh, the, the burden of uh, this uh, emergency is on, on uh, the shoulders of uh, the countries of the Sahel who are not able to face the situation because they are very poor. Uh, in this sense, I want to tell you that uh, of course, even yesterday we had a, um, a foreign affairs meeting of the ministers of foreign affairs of the European Union here in New York uh, um, at the margins of the General Assembly of the United Nations. And the issue of migration was raised several times because, for instance, we have uh, many, many projects uh, ongoing uh, to tackle illegal migration and especially uh, human trafficking in Niger. And of course, now with the coup d'etat and the new junta we have to find a way of sustaining these projects that have been ongoing for many years and I have to say with great success because there are projects that are funded by the European Union but by member states including Italy for instance in Agadez I have myself visited the centers several times in which uh, young people are rescued from uh, the deserts in which they risk to, to, to die for instance and uh, given a new opportunity to, uh, to have a new life just to give you an example not only. Niger was the country that accepted the first uh, humanitarian corridors that were created by the uh, Valdesian table and uh, the um, Sant'Egidio and, uh, and uh, the Vatican. And uh, they were very cooperative. So you can imagine how important it is the political uh, situation in these countries in uh, tackling this, uh, uh, this um, very, very serious issue. Uh, in this sense, I want to make a note on the coastal countries. Uh, one of the reasons why the coastal countries are also so concerned by the advancement of terrorism is because it produces a lot of uh, a lot of uh, um a lot of refugees. Togo is affected very much, and this is why Togo is cooperating militarily with the Burkina Faso to try to stop the, 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 this phenomenon because it's impossible for them to uh, respond to this emergency. And uh, regarding the coup d'etat, let me say one thing, there are differences. ECOWAS itself makes uh, differences between the coup d'etat in the different countries of the Sahel. There are different origins, different histories, different uh, uh, motivations, different si current situations. And to be very honest, in Niger, this is uh, not the first coup. Uh, there were six uh, attempted coup d'etat since 2010. So the real problem is, how do we stop uh, coup d'etat being the way by which you change the things you don't like? Because in some cases, uh, for instance, in Burkina Faso, the, 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 the coup was really uh, pushed uh, both in 2014 and recently by uh, groups of activists and population. While in Mali, it was very different. In Niger, it's even more different because every situation is completely um, per se, so to speak. And therefore, we have to be very careful. ECOWAS itself asked, um, the president of the, the, the commission asked me while we were in the summit in Abuja, he said, "How help us uh, understand how can we stop this series of coup d'etat? Because uh, they are the way by which people think they can change uh, the, 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 the situation. So, of course, when we talk about democracy, yes, of course, we have the ambition of having democracy. But which democracy? It's another story. I always talk about the contextual de democracy. And I also want to say that it is true that, of course, we want elections. Because for, for us, elections are a guarantee. But the people want access to, so, to to services. And this is something that we have to put together. At one point, we have to reconnect all this because people are living in the, the, the worst conditions ever. So we need elections, we need democracy, but then we need elections to produce a leadership that can deliver. Otherwise, uh, there will be another coup d'etat.
this is the real problem in my view because I see these things every day and this is the very sad situation we are facing. And uh, of course, we hope uh, to change uh, uh, the situation in the future. I think that ECOWAS remains the, the, the mother. Uh, I remember the Prime Minister told, she said to me, is the mother um, uh, of an uh, organization of all of us, uh, of all of the Africans, of course. I think it is still the most important uh, organization in West Africa. The European Union, for instance, absolutely supports the leadership of the, 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 the ECOWAS. Certainly, the ECOWAS itself now it's facing its own crisis in the sense that uh, it is not easy to take decisions, for instance, like uh, threatening to intervene militarily. It's a huge problem. And also, as Mardier uh, rightly uh, um, um, underlined, it's also an African uh, problem because there is an African culture that we have to respect, understand and humbly follow because this is exactly what we, we need to be African. And of course, we are not African but we can at least respect Africans enough to understand their dynamics. Um, we have uh, come to the end of the hour at our disposal, so I'd like to ask you if you have any uh, quick reactions to each other's, uh, to what we have heard from the other panelists. If you don't, um, thanks a lot. Um, we had a discussion that very clearly gave us a sense of the uncertainty and the fluidity of the entire situation. Uh, I, I think it helped us trying to understand what the main challenges uh, on the table are. Uh, so thank you very much, Emanuela Del Rey, uh, EU Special Representative for the Sahel, uh, Jean Hervé Jezequel, uh, Director Sahel Project International Crisis Group. I hope I got your surname <coughs> right. And Abdoulaye Mardier, Yeye, uh, UN Special Coordinator for Development in the Sahel, and Joe Siegler, Director of Research Africa Center for Strategic Studies in Washington. Thank you very much for your contribution. Um, uh, thanks. We are looking forward to having you to uh, our future events and have a good evening to you and to our audience.